Good day, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Timothy Lee, and I am a research analyst at Red Cloud Securities, and I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on gold and copper exploration and development today. We will hear from Melanie Layden, uh, CEO of Titan Minerals Limited. During today's webinar, she will provide an overview and outlook. Uh, then we will take questions, and you can type your questions into the chat box at any time, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, before we kick things off, first we need to discuss a little fine print uh, during the, this Titan webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I would direct listeners to the company's forward-looking statements disclosure outlined uh, in the Titan corporate presentation that can be found on the company's website, titanminerals.com.au. Uh, for Red Cloud Securities, Inc., I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. Uh, please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures pertaining to Titan. Uh, so we have Titan presenting today. Titan is focused on mineral exploration in Ecuador, where it has a portfolio of high quality projects with both epithermal gold and porphyry copper targets. Uh, we recently initiated coverage on Titan with a buy rating and a 30 cent Australian target price. Uh, the company is TTM on the ASX. With that, I now turn it over to Melanie to update our audience on the company. Thanks very much, Tim. It's great to be here. And uh, it's, it's evening uh, my time, 10 p.m., so apologies um, if I'm a, a little slow tonight. I have had a coffee to get me started. Um, as, as Tim mentioned, disclaimer of forward-looking statements, please um, take a look at that at your leisure. Um, and it's with pleasure that I provide you an update on Titan Minerals, where we're at uh, and what we're planning on doing. Um, and I guess uh, as an overview, you know, we feel that we are very well positioned to create value for shareholders. We're in Ecuador. Um, you know, prospectivity is um, is second to none. You know, it's it's at about five percent of the um, stage of exploration as to where Chile was or, or is, and maybe akin to where it was maybe 30, 40 years ago. Um, Peru has been fairly well picked over, but Ecuador still has a lot of um, you know, great potential and, and large scale projects. And we're very pleased to be holding three of those projects 100%. Um, the, our board and in-country management are, are very well credentialed um, for this stage of the project. You know, we're, we're an exploration company and very focused on systematic exploration and we've got the right people in place, uh, you know, for that journey that we're on. Um, balance sheet is, is very good. It's, um, we've dealt with previous incumbent assets and now we just have our three primary projects with, which we're directing all of our exploration towards um, with, um, you know, clear strategy as to where we're heading. And of course, um, you know, a significant opportunity to create value for our shareholders through systematic exploration um, and then potentially attracting the right partner to, to progress our projects. Uh, as I touched on before, our, our board, uh, Peter Cook is a geologist, mineral economist, um, has built and dealt on many mines, particularly in Australia, but also Asia. Um, Matthew Carr is a businessman, project developer. Tamara Brown, uh, engineer and based in, in Canada herself and, and a lot of experience in, in you know, South America and, and Ecuador and capital markets. Um, Mick Rowley, again, uh, a commerce um, and financier. Barry Bourne, a geophysicist, he's worked with most of the major companies around the world in these types of terrains, um, searching for porphyries and epithermal, epithermal deposits. And of course, myself, I joined Titan Minerals in January this year after consulting to them for around six to nine, to nine months. Um, I'm a geologist myself, um, <laughs> a business master. That's funny. I don't think I put that there, but I do have a business degree um, and also quite a bit of experience in, in Latin America, particularly in Chile. I spent 10 years working for, for Hot Chile there. Um, so a lot of experience in South America and, uh, and mineral exploration experience, particularly at these types of projects. Um, the capital structure, I'll let you read that at your leisure. Um, but just to highlight the, the top 10 shareholders, um, which um, actually own 
close to 60% of the um, of the stock. Um, so very tightly held register, good high net um, client, um, sorry, shareholders and, and funds in the mix as well. So yeah, the top 10 hold 60% and the top 20 are around 75% of the register. Sorry, excuse me. Um, so why Ecuador? I, I touched on it earlier and really it's the opportunity that's there that that is emerging that that I guess most of the other South American countries and, and other more developed countries don't offer the same potential. Uh, a lot of the majors are moving into town and for good reason. Um, you know, the, the Lasso um, government is very supportive of responsible mining um, and mining is considered critical to, to Ecuador's you know, revitalization of their economy. Um, you know, very much moving up in the ranks of um, mining investment attractiveness um, from the Fraser Institute. And um, and you can see why with, you know, the lowest effective tax rates and, and fastest permitting in, in Latin America. So, you know, it's a very good place to be um, holding 100% projects um, with, you know, no hurdles to, to exploration or development and, and very friendly, um, you know, tax and permitting regimes. Um, you know, Ecuador has several major projects at this stage advancing through exploration, through to development and production and Fruta del Norte and, and Mirador are two good examples of that. And, uh, you know, they've contributed significantly, I think it was $2.7 billion last year that they contributed to Ecuador's um, economy. So, you know, very much a part of their economy and uh, and they are very supportive of it. Um, so, so yeah, and, and internal, so contributing significantly to, to taxes and, and employment and in infrastructure. But in fact, infrastructure in, in Ecuador is, is, um, is, is very good in terms of, um, you know, transport and, and energy um, and, and things like that. You know, it's, it's very well placed. Moving on. Um, just to touch a little bit on the strategy of Titan and, and I guess to reiterate, you know, we are a, a focused um, and, um, you know, a very considered exploration company and we do things very systematically. So, you know, the last 12 to 18 months have been very much about building the, the foundation data sets across each of our projects and, and improving the technical standards, um, you know, which I guess things previously with our, you know, the previous owners of, of our land holdings perhaps didn't do things systematically. And, and that has presented opportunities for us because now we can fill in those gaps and, and really understand the geology and, you know, identify targets and, and the potential. And now we're very well positioned to, um, to be able to test those targets and very high conviction targets. Um, you know, we've been very much focused on, on building our ESG, ESG credentials and we've got um, a committed CSR team um, dedicated to improving and building the relationship with the communities which in, with, which in we operate. Um, and we've been very much welcomed by the communities and, you know, through, through the good work of the team on the ground, we do things like um, supplying corn to farmers for, for them to plant crops. Um, we are always try and employ locally wherever possible. And, you know, we, we're doing some small scale um, infrastructure developments to supply, you know, fresh water and, um, you know, um, improve road conditions and things like that in the country. So very good working relationship with the community that, that, we, that we are within. Um, and it, it sort of goes hand in hand with our business and, and our exploration strategy. So to the projects, as I said before, 100% held, um, you know, three large scale projects. Um, and I guess ordered by advancement in terms of exploration uh, work completed and understanding um, Dynasty Gold project would come first the Linderos project second and Copper Duke third. Um, and, and I say that in terms of advancement, in terms of exploration, yes. In terms of potential, you might flip them around the other way because Copper Duke, while we sort of know less about it, the foundation data sets that we've build, been building over the last 12 to 18 months are really um, painting quite a compelling picture um, for that moving up the ranks. Um, and I guess you can see from the image on the right, we're surrounded by pedigree, um, you know, projects and companies um, with, you know, large scale 
copper gold porphyry and epithermal gold deposits um, and you know so we are obviously hoping to emulate what other companies have done in the area and I think with the land holding that we have um, you know we're the right geology the right terrain um, you know within that corridor of mineralization you know extending from Peru through to northern Ecuador um, with the Miocene age intrusions which um, you know we're in that Miocene belt so we're very much in the right um, real estate with our projects. Um, and again, I just touched on, on Ecuador being so uh, rich in infrastructure. The Pan American Highway transects our dynasty project. Look, there's daily flights within a two hour drive of the projects and um, a port 200 kilometres to the west. And as I touched on before, um, the province, the Loja province where we are, um, has got wind and solar renewable energy, which is connected to the grid. So, you know, very well um, located in an infrastructure rich um, area. So just starting with the um, the dynasty project. So again, it's all about systematic exploration and, and that's really what we've been doing for the past 12 to 18 months. And, and that's key in building a, uh, you know, a robust 3D geological model. Um, through building this model or, or, or collecting these data sets, we have um, drastically improved understanding of the geology. So we now better understand the deposits that have already been drilled, but we also understand the potential, you know, outside of those, um, you know, drilled areas, extensions to the epithermal um, and also, um, you know, porphyry, um, sorry, porphyry prospects that have also been identified there. Um, we're also moving forward. There, there's a current resource at Dynasty of just a bit over 2 million ounces of gold close to 17 million ounces of silver. So a very strong foundation to, to build upon. And we've got multiple work streams, um, you know, that are well advanced to facilitate the update of that to a uh, JORP 2012 compliant. Currently it's a NI43101 compliant, um, but Titan has done um, quite some drilling since it was last updated. And um, obviously we're an ASX listed and governed company so the intent is to update that to jolt 2012 compliance so well underway with that at the moment as well um and i guess outside of that the explorability explorability of the project is very good you know we've got 50 percent outcrop and, and providing excellent excellent exposure for um for our team you know they're doing lots of surface mapping um surface geochemical sampling um so the fact that it's all exposed at surface makes it so much easier um, and only 20% of the project has been explored to date. So I, I touched on it before, um, but yeah, the 2 million ounces of gold that sits within this nine kilometre long epithermal corridor um, it is a very good starting point for us. Um, of that nine kilometre corridor, really less than half of it has been drilled. Um, so the, the, yellow, um, the yellow circles or polygons uh, on the image indicate the extents or extensions to the epithermal mineralization that haven't yet been tested by drilling. Um, there was some trial mining completed by our, our predecessors um, and I guess the end result was that um, there was 40% more gold or 40% more ounces produced, higher ton tonnage, slightly lower grade and you know there's probably two reasons for that is, is one that they identified additional mineralized veins while they were mining, um, which, you know, you're always going to find in these types of systems, there's probably always going to be additional veins that aren't identified from the, the current drill spacing. But not only that, the, the wall rock, the diorite wall rock itself is also um, mineralized and, and that obviously adds to, to the, the volume and the tons mined as well. So I guess in summary, you know, we believe that there's still significant potential remaining for extensions to the, the epithermal um, mineralization. And look, we've got preparations well advanced to, to start drill testing those extensional targets. Um, a little bit more about Dynasty Project, um, not so much just the epithermal corridor, but also um, several porphyry centers have been identified at the project as well. So. Um, you know, the focus, I guess, for our, our company is 
not only developing those epithermal corridor or the epithermal deposits, but the porphyry deposits as well. So, you know, you can see the extents that are there um, to be tested for the epithermal veining, but also the porphyry, the calaman and lazanka and cola porphyries that have been identified. Um, and these have been confirmed. The calaman porphyry in particular has been confirmed by, by both drilling and surface mapping and surface geochemistry. Lazanka and cola porphyries have been identified at surface by mapping and geochemistry, but not, not yet been drilled. Um, and I guess to add to the other, the work that's been done across um, Dynasty in the last few years is um, a, a comprehensive geophysical survey has been conducted across the entire project area um, with the geophysics and the magnetics in particular identifying that this epithermal corridor, although it hasn't been drilled, the remaining five kilometres has actually been mapped by the, the geophysics. So although it's under undercover, it, it still continues. So um, very much still a target there to be tested. Um, and I guess you might also be able to see on the map, there's quite a few pink um, pink dots um, here, here and there, particularly up in the top right corner. There's a lot of pink dots there and they refer to um, rock chip samples and they're sort of plus five gram per tonne um, gold rock chips. So again, a, a lot of support to um, suggest that the epithermal mineralisation continues. Uh, so a little bit more about the, the Calaman porphyry. The image on the left hand side is, is a magnetic image showing the um, analytic signal. Um, and I guess you can see well, you might not be able to see, but the, the red sort of hot spots imply that they are um, diorite intrusions um, and they are generally the, the host rock implicated with, with porphyry deposits. So that kind of intrusive activity is very encouraging at the project. Um, and so the porphyry itself was actually um, intersected actually by accident when Titan did some drilling for, of Cerro Verde, which was part of the epithermal um, part of the deposit. Um, back in 2021, and they clipped, you know, close to 103 metres at 1.5 grams per tonne gold from very shallow depths, sort of 46 metres down hole. So the cross section on the right hand side shows where that um, mineralisation was, was hit um, and really was quite unexpected because the target was the epithermal vein. So to the fact that we've got both the epithermal gold plus the porphyry gold in that same zone sort of shows an overlapping of the systems. and. And you know that has quite large implications for the for the economics of <clears throat> of the deposit at Dynasty, but also for further exploration. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, so the revelation of, of the porphyry sitting right next to Cerro Verde, it really did make the, the company step back and, and look at the big picture um, and the potential implications of a much larger scale deposit. So since then, considerable efforts have gone into undertaking, um, you know, exploration over the Calaman porphyry area. So detailed surface mapping, um, surface geochemistry, um, and also we've had um, Dr. Scott Halley, you know, a world-renowned porphyry and geochemist um, expert who has been guiding us with, um, you know, really understanding what this means and uh, and and giving us some key insights into, into the porphyry mineralisation. And it does look like it's more of a gold-rich porphyry that potentially um, dips under Cerro Verde. Um, uh, I, I probably won't bore you with the details of the geochemistry, although for some of you might you might find this far from boring, but um, the image on the right um, basically is saying that that Cerro Verde is 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 comparably um, sorry, it, it's got coincidence, you know, high copper, moly, and bismuth, and and comparably low um, arsenic, um, indicating that we are um, you know kind of right within the the sweet spot of a porphyry system. I guess you know we're very proximal to a porphyry. Whereas if you look at the Iguana um, prospect to the north and the western side of Cerro Verde, you know, you can see those, um, the copper, moly and bismuth are, are quite a bit cooler, quite lower. Um, and then the arsenic in turn is higher. So they, this kind of indicates that we're more distal to the porphyry source and a slightly cooler, you know, metal environment. But I guess it still bodes well for the fact that we're still getting that metal signature 
it just shows that we're at a different level in the system. Um, and although at Iguana itself we haven't intersected porphyry mineralisation, we it does contain diorite di dikes, sorry, of the same composition that we um, that host the mineralisation at Cerro Verde. So there's definitely potential for more porphyry mineralisation at Iguana also. We just haven't quite hit it yet and it might be slightly deeper or, or just to the side. So so obviously still more work to be done there, but the Calaman porphyry is is definitely a high priority for us to, to drill test. Um, moving on to our next project, which is Linderos. Um, it sits about 20 kilometres to the west of Dynasty, um, and, and exploration to date has largely been focused on the, the Copper Ridge and the Mesita prospects, and you might have seen recently we put out some drilling results from, from both of those prospects. So work has largely been directed there, but there is, um, you know, many other targets, I think close to 20 targets at the, at the project that are yet to be tested. So definitely um, drilling done by us recently, late, late last year um, by Titan has proved that there is a substantial porphyry copper gold system at Copper Ridge. Um, and that there is intermediate sulfidation um, epithermal gold system at Mesita. So both of them have been proven by drilling. But what we do see from the geochemistry is that there is other similar look-alike intermediate sulfidation um, gold silver systems and pore free centres um, at the project. So these prospects will continue to be worked up until such a point that they are, are ready to be drilled. Um, but the focus for now will be to continue our evaluation of Copper Ridge and Mesita. So just a little bit more on, on, on Copper Ridge, and I guess this goes back to pre-drilling. Pre Sorry. Pre-drilling, um, the surface geochemistry was really what first identified it, along with um, outcrop, but, you know, it's a one-kilometre diameter textbook porphyry signature, coincident copper gold molly in the centre and distal zoned, you know, base metal lead zinc um, on the on the periphery and surface mapping and historical drilling. You know, they'd convert, it had confirmed the presence of diorite intrusions and, and porphyry style mineralisation and along with channel sampling completed by Titan. So, you know, we, we had gathered information to the point that it was time to drill. Um, so late last year was our maiden drilling campaign eight holes drilled and, you know, very successful results with, you know, wide mineralised diorite porphyry from very shallow depths. So um, a little bit more on, on Copper Ridge. So as I, as I said, eight holes drilled, um, very pleasingly six of those eight holes actually ended in mineralisation. Um, and, and they all were mineralised to a certain extent, but then two holes in particular, hole three and hole six, um, definitely intersected some higher grade mineralisation, um, you know, 76 metres of 0.5% copper equivalent in hole three, and that's just only for 132 metres, and 72 metres at 0.4% copper equivalent from 21 metres um, in hole Six. Sorry, I didn't put the whole numbers there. But, and I guess what this indicates is that there is um, definitely potential for higher grade copper gold mineralisation within the system. Um, and our initial drilling was really, um, I would consider it scout drilling, and we were just testing the system and seeing what was there and collecting information on uh, the geochemistry. So the fact that we got such good results in this first campaign of drilling, I think um, it, it's pretty exciting for the company. Um, and, I, and I guess to point out as well that the grades, um, they're actually really very comparable with peer porphyry deposits um, advancing through development. Um, and I guess one that comes to mind is, is Sol Gold's Alpala deposit. You know, it's got a re resource of 3.2 billion tonnes, um, grading 0.49% copper equivalent. And the higher grade core for, for their porphyry actually doesn't commence until, you know, close to six or 700 metres below surface. So. Uh, the fact that we're getting these grades, um, you know, quite a bit higher in the system, I think it bodes very well for us and, and it's sort of just the tip of the iceberg for us, I think, in, in what we've unveiled at Copper Ridge. And we're, we are well and truly in the porphyry race. Okay, so moving on to the Mesita project, prospect. 
which actually sits adjacent to just to the north of Copper Ridge. 14 holes were drilled um, by Titan late last year and results were released just last week um, uh, after receiving them all back from, from the lab. And I guess uh, signif of significance is that, um, you know, we intersected some really quite high grade gold and good width gold um, in this maiden campaign of drilling. And, um, you know, it's, it demonstrates the potential that there is quite a bit of epithermal gold mineralisation, you know, right next to the, the Copper Ridge Porphyry deposit and, you know, extensive hydro hydrothermal alteration high grade gold hosted in sub vertical structures, um, you know, at, at the margins of, of the diorite porphyry stock. So I, I think that, you know, this drilling really has proven that there is a shallow intermediate sulfidation um, gold system and and it's and Copper Ridge is implicated as as the source of the mineralization as well, the porphyry. Um, and just to put things into context, it's, it's quite a conceptual um, schematic long section, um, but it just shows really, you know, that Copper Ridge and Mesita right, are really right are next, sorry, are right next to each other. There's less than 500 metres um, between the two um, deposits, I guess, and, and between our, our drilling. And you can see here again that the porphyry system itself is open pretty much in all directions um, and that the, the deposits are, are very much linked and that, um, you know, Copper Ridge really is the plumbing to the system at, at Mesita. So I think, you know, we're onto something really quite big here um, and our maiden drilling has delivered very promising results. And, the, and there's plenty of scope to vector towards, you know, that higher grade mineralisation, um, you know, with, with strong ve vectors in the geochemistry and the other data sets that we're looking at. Moving on to our Copper Duke project, um, I would say last but definitely not least, um, and you know, quite possibly the jewel in the crown. Um, and I guess the name says it all. The Duke is a a noble a nobleman with the uh, you know the highest hereditary rank. So that sums up Copper Duke, I guess. Um, it, <laughs> sorry, a magnetic um, geophysical survey. Um, has identified um, a cor corridor hosting multiple intrusive centres at the project. Open Energy Chemistry has also identified a you know a plus seven kilometre porphyry corridor with coincident you know gold, copper, and molybdenum. And surprisingly, is that you know this project has been largely untested by drilling. There's only been four holes ever drilled. Two were completed by the UN in the uh, in the 1970s. So. I think for such a large project with such large potential, um, it's quite surprising that so few drill holes have been put into it. But, um, and I guess we're here to change that in the fact that the, for the last 12 to 18 months, we've been gathering all of the required data sets to, um, to really vector in onto the best priority targets and, and where to drill at the project. So, so we're very well placed in that regard. Um, a little bit more about Copper Duke and I, I guess this slide speaks to all of the data sets um, that again confirm the large potential at, at Copper Ridge and you know make no mistake it is a large project and there's a lot of prospective ground to cover um, and you know it's for this reason that we've been doing all of the systematic exploration and, and gathering all of those foundation data sets because every layer of information um, insists at uh, assists in vectoring us to to where we need to be and it you know it's this type of disciplined approach that um you know that's what finds big deposits and look there are no shortcuts um and but the good thing is is we are well ahead of the curve we're a long way up the curve with several drill ready targets now so and i guess for this reason it's it has earned the interest and the attraction of of quite a few um you know majors and and, and others that are really um, standing up and taking notice. Um, and there's, you know, there's several that have conducted site visits as well. And I guess the overwhelming response from them is that um, it's it's very positive and a credit to, to the team on the ground and Pablo Morelli, our exploration manager, is that, you know, they're, they're extremely impressed with the technical standards of the team and firstly, and then secondly, they, they can really see the potential of the project. So um, I think that um, the maps, probably in these um, 
in these presentations probably don't do it justice and it's hard to present you know 12 kilometers worth of targets in you know an a5 um, piece of paper so i think that um there's a lot more to the project than, than meets the eye um, and certainly a lot of exciting targets there. Okay, last slide on Copper Duke. So, and I guess the question is, okay, where to from here? And, and the answer to that is we will continue to build those foundation regional generative data sets. You know, it, they're low cost, and but they take time, but the value that they add is... Um, you know, it's invaluable. You you can't do it without that data. So so that will have continue in the background, but it's time now to test some of our concepts and to test some of those high conviction targets. And um, you know, we will be testing them by drilling in in a very staged, methodical manner. So manner. So you know, we're at that stage now that um, you know we will drill some of these targets. And as you can see from these um, the images and the photos, it looks good. I mean, the porphyry, the veining, the mineralisation and, and all of the other um, vectors, um, you know, we're in the right spot, I think. So, and I guess at this point is at some point in time, we will find the right partner to work with in developing the Copper Duke project because, you know, this is a big project with, with big potential. Why Titan? Um, and I, I guess I probably don't need to tell you all about the copper fundamentals, um, looming supply shortage, um, you know, brought on by the green en energy revolution. And, and there's a sense of urgency, I think, by the majors to, to fill that um, that gap gap that's coming. And, th and that's bringing on new investment in, in emerging jurisdictions such as Ecuador. So, you know, like I said earlier, compared to Chile, it's only 5% explored in Ecuador. Um, you know, other South American countries have either been, you know, picked over and explored or are um, experiencing, you know, uncertainty and risk. Um, but Ecuador at this point in time, and I think going into the future, is, um, you know, the government is very much supportive of the mining industry and sees it as a big part of their economy um, going forward. So, I think paired with the, the Ecuadorian government support, um, natural mineral, mineral endowment, um, you know, Ecuador really is the place to be. And Titan has the advantage of advanced exploration projects and high priority targets that are they're drill ready. So, you know, we're, we're well ahead of the curve on that. And what I hear um, through the grapevine is that majors are looking for projects that are drill ready and, you know, we, we fit the bill there with that. Um, just a little bit about the copper development pipeline and I touched on it earlier around copper grades but you know I think we're all aware that the you know the world's top copper mines they're, they're getting old you know the average age of the top 10 copper mines is 95 years old so they're getting deeper they're getting more expensive to operate and the grades are declining um, but you know and the, so the average grade of current operating mines is 0.53 percent Projects under development are 0.35% uh, to 0.39% copper. So it sort of gives you an indication of, of the types of grades that are being contemplated going forward for, for copper developments. And what this what that in, what that means then is that there's there's a drastic amount of um, incentivization required to bring these new projects online. So it, it will mean really in the end that you know the copper price in the next potentially 10 years will be up around $5.50 a pound because $150 billion needs to be invested in the development of these copper projects to meet, you know, the ambitious net zero targets that, that the globe is, you know, looking to achieve. So the looming deficit in, um, in copper will need to be incentivised and, um, you know, the, the copper pricing environment will, um, will dictate that and, like I said, the, the majors are here to make those investments and um, and to get ahead of the curve now. And I and I and I like this this quote from the International Energy Agency: "It's meeting climate goals will turbocharge the demand for minerals such as copper, with a looming mismatch between mineral supply and climate ambition." Because I think that is very true. Um, so I guess finally the, the investment synopsis, why invest in Titan? 
I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but drill ready, large scale copper gold projects um, and, you know, with a significantly reduced lead time to, um, to discovery and development, which for these types of deposits, it's generally 17 years from discovery until they commence mining. So, you know, they're, they're long term projects and we are well ahead of the curve. Um, systematic, disciplined exploration. That's what Titan Minerals is about. Um, and that's what's required to find the, you know, the big ones. Um, I already touched on it. Look, we have a solid foundation to build upon. We've already got 2 million ounces of gold at Dynasty and definitely large potential to, to increase those resources, not only gold, but copper as well. Um, excellent chance for significant porphyry copper gold discoveries and, and meaningful discoveries, I mean, that can fill that gap. So high conviction targets that are ready to drill this year. And I, I touched on it as well, um, you know, 100% held projects, no encumbrances, ability to attract, you know, the right partner um, to do value, value accretive deals for our shareholders while maintaining exposure to the potential upside at our project. So all in all, an exciting time for Titan shareholders um, with plenty of news to come in what promises to be a very busy year for the company. And that was my last slide. That concludes the presentation. Great. Thank you, Melody, uh, for the very informative presentation. Um, we'll now uh, start the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, a reminder to everyone on the line that you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. Uh, we already do have a few questions here. Um, I, I guess first, looking at, uh, at the Dynasty Project um, and the updated uh, resource uh, that's anticipated this year, how much of that would you expect to, to uh, how much would you expect to grow that resource versus how much of the work is more focused on just bringing it to to JOR compliance and uh, kind of maybe upgrading some parts of it? Yeah, good question. Look, I think the the main aim of this resource update will be to make it JOR compliant, and I have the feeling it will be comparable to the previous resource. So, and I guess Titan's drilling that was done in the last sort of eighteen months was directed largely at verifying the previous drilling um, so there was so there was twin drilling there was infill drilling and there was a lot of um, data verification and uh, and checks and balances QAQC programs umpire lab, lab checks so I guess there was a lot of questions that needed to be answered and now they have been answered and we can move forward with a robust, robust jaw compliant resource um, so I guess that was the the aim of of Titan's work programs to now. But in saying that, I do know that there was extensional targets that were um, did meet with good results from Titan's drilling. So there definitely is the potential to add the resources at this point in time. Um, but I, I, admittedly, I haven't seen the numbers yet. We're not at that stage yet. So um, it's more around understanding the geology, getting the model right in terms of the geological model and the, and the mineralization controls. And once you've got that right, then the resource estimate does it for itself. So it's about understanding the geology first. Great. Um, and shifting to Copper Duke, there's one question, and you and you did have the map and had had spoken about. Are there any specific targets that you're most excited to drill at at Copper Duke? Yes, um, the El Huato target itself. Um, sorry, I'll go back to my presentation. It is definitely the highest conviction target, and I and I guess. For mainly because we've done the most work on it in terms of the, the mapping and channel sampling, sampling and trenching. And um, yeah, so I think the El Huato prospect, the Blanquillo prospect is also um, very prospective. It's a little bit further away. It's up in the, um, the northeastern corner. Um, but yeah, there's sort of three, I'm trying to get to that slide, sorry. And you'll have to excuse me because I am actually relatively new to some of this information. So it's a lot to take in for me as I'm sure it is for you as well. So I'm trying to get to it, sorry. Uh, I thought I had them outlined, sorry. Well, and but what I can say, though, is that I do intend on doing a series of technical updates in terms of ASX releases in the in the forthcoming, you know, weeks to months. And really, because I keep talking about all of these foundation data sets that we've been building behind the scenes and no one's really seen it and no one 
I guess probably gives us the value for it. So the intent is to to publish some of that work so that people probably have a better understanding about what I'm talking about in terms of the prospectivity and why we like these targets. Okay, great, great. Um, one question, looking more on the on the corporate side, and a popular question uh, quite often: What options are being investigated for funding, and when is this likely to be required? <laughs> That's a question everyone likes to ask. Uh, well, a number of funding contemplations. Um, as I touched on in the presentation, we have um, hosted a number of site visits to the projects this year. Um, and, and I think three projects this size in the hands of a, a junior explorer, you know, it's a lot. Um, it's not that we don't have the appetite or the desire to keep progressing all of them ourselves. We just know that at some point in time we will need a partner. So that, that is a contemplation, whether it be a joint venture partner or whether it be, you know, a major or a corporate come onto the register, excuse me, at some point um, that is being contemplated. Look, and, you know, we're, we're looking at all, all types of options, royalty streaming arrangements. Um, <clears throat> so that I guess we're looking at all options and we'll make the right choice for, for the, the shareholders. Excuse me, I'm just going to have a drink. Great. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, if you do have the funding, um, obviously with, as you commented, the three significant projects with, uh, with, you know, work plans on all three, what would, what would be approximately the budgets or the proportion of the budget uh, allocated to each project? Well, I think that each project has, um, merits to, to, and I, and I think that we would be looking to allocate a similar quantum of budget to each of the projects given the similar scale. I guess we're testing different things at each project, but they all warrant, I would say, around four to 5,000 metres of drilling at each project. So the quantum of budget that we're looking at would be around $10 million US, I think, to do all that we would like to do in the coming 12 months. And, and I guess that would give us the chance to really demonstrate the value at each of the projects um, and, and then you know, in turn, potentially be well positioned to attract the right JV partner and, and do it at a time where we've really demonstrated the value of the projects. Okay, great. Um, and kind of related on the funding side, obviously a, a, a secondary project here, but when would you expect to receive or have you already received the final payment for Zaruma? We haven't quite received the final payment. We're in very close discussions with the, um, with the, with the, the new owners um, and so we are expecting them they have been making payments um, on a relatively regular basis um, so I would hope to think within the coming weeks that we would have the balance of those payments in. Okay great um, and you had commented on the on the copper grades of, of projects out there um, the initial <laughs> drilling results from Copper Ridge were successful in demonstrating size potential and and right from surface um, uh, but a few of the holes were lower grade, um, but but did have high grade portions within them. Um, are there signs that you would be able to vector in on a higher grade uh, portion or higher grade core there? Yeah, look, there are there definitely are signs, and I guess you know porphyry is the way that they they develop is that you know they, there's multiple phases of intrusions, and generally there's a there's a pre mineral intrusion which is not particularly well mineralized. There's an early intrusion, which generally has most of the metal and is well mineralized. And then you get later and later phases, which are less and less um, mineralized. And I guess what we're aiming to do is find that early mineral porphyry. And I feel like we've probably, um, we've intersected small portions of it within our drilling in, indicated by the, you know, the plus 0 0.5, 0 0.6% copper equivalents that we, that we have seen in our drilling. Um, so there's definitely indications that it's there. Uh, we just haven't quite hit it yet. So in terms of vectoring towards it, geochemistry is, is really key for us. Um, so we're doing 48 element analysis on all of our all of our drill samples. So that really gives us a good understanding as to where we're at in the system. Um, key experts are helping us, like I touched on before, Dr. Scott Halley, um, world-renowned geochemist, I think he's probably worked on more than 100 porphyries globally. And so he kind of really knows his stuff. And what he does is is really paints the picture as to where we sit in comparison to other porphyries and you know how better to vector to those higher grade um, you know parts of the porphyry system um, and i guess outside of that is 
our geologists are doing very systematic um, logging of the core, so we really understand the geology, vein abundances, um, sulfide percentages. So it's that systematic exploration that will get us in the right spot. But I think I touched on it earlier. I mean, six out of eight holes ended in mineralisation. And, you know, so there's there's nothing actually stopping the porphyry from continuing, and I believe that it does. And often in these systems, the better grade uh, mineralisation might start slightly deeper. So, but that isn't necessarily a problem for the development of these types of deposits, as I referred to, you know, Sol Gold and the Alpala deposit. I mean, they're contemplating a very large scale block caving underground operation there on their project. And they're looking at sort of a 25 plus year mine life. So very significant deposits and they don't need to be large at surface or laterally extensive. Um, so they can extend at depth and be very high grade. Great. Great. And uh, I uh, guess one more question here. Um, when would you, is, is the mineralization you've encountered at Linderos kind of typical of, uh, of porphyries and, and, uh, and epithermal, uh, I guess intermediate sulfidation epithermals? And when, uh, I guess there's a question about the metallurgy. Uh, when would you plan to do initial metallurgical test work on samples from, from Lindros? Yes. Um, okay, so typical porphyry, absolutely. I think geochemically and um, mineralogically, geologically, it's a typical porphyry. Um, good question about the metallurgy. We are starting that process now, um, particularly uh, I talk about copper equivalent, so reporting a copper equivalent, you have to have some kind of metallurgical understanding. So at the moment, we're using assumptions from our peer deposits, similar style deposits, similar grades. Um, but no, very much I believe that um, metallurgically, the porphyry itself shouldn't be a problem and very similar to other porphyry systems. The epithermal system, I don't understand as well, and we haven't yet commenced any metallurgical test work on that yet. Okay, great. And one final question, obviously, it was your initial round of drilling at, at Lindros, but how how close do you think you'd be to a resource estimate at Lindros? Ooh, I think eight holes is probably a bit, bit early for a resource. I think, and I touched on it as well with Dynasty, it's really about having a good geological model so that you can have some confidence in the continuity of the mineralization between holes. So I think if we understand that um, and we have the right geology, um, then a resource shouldn't be a problem. But look, uh, it's hard to say really. I, I'm not a resource geologist. I have got some experience in resource geology, but I'm not a resource geologist anymore. But typically these types of deposits, you have, uh, I guess, an indicated resource. You probably want holes on an 80 metre spacing, um, maybe inferred 150, 160 metre spacing. So I guess we're not too far off for an inferred resource. Um, but yeah, I guess you'd want to know how much there was, I guess, before you went down that path and, and have a really good understanding of the geology. And, and I think another campaign of drilling will certainly get us there. Okay, great. Great. And, uh, oh, I guess one more question here. Um, how are you managing community relations uh, in the Dynasty Project? How are we managing it? Well, I, I touched on it before. We have a very dedicated CSR team um, Ceci is our um, community relations manager and she spends a lot of time on the ground uh, and she also has a team as well that supports her. But it's about knocking on doors, it's about getting amongst the community, it's about fostering the relationships with the people, um, with the politicians, you know, with, with everyone in, in the community. And, and we've done, that's been a big focus for us and, and I think previous owners um, probably weren't so focused on that kind of thing. So we were really starting from scratch a few years ago, but, you know, I, I'm very proud to say that we, um, we've we made great headways. Um, we're very well supported in the community and, and very much a part of the community. And, you know, we like to employ locally wherever possible. So say, for instance, for the upcoming drilling campaign, we'll be, you know, employing people from the local communities to assist with field work and, and things like that. Um, and yeah, you know, we, we definitely have got a very close relationship with the community and, and we're all about benefit to them. Um, so so I, I think that goes hand in hand with our exploration strategy. Great. Well, I think that's all the questions uh, we have today. 
Uh, I'd like to thank Melanie uh, for presenting today. And thank you, everyone on the line, for tuning in and for your attention. Uh, just a reminder, Red Cloud Securities will be back next week, uh, March 2nd and 3rd, with our pre-PDAC conference at the Sheraton in downtown Toronto, uh, where we'll have about 90 companies presenting as well as keynote speakers. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Jim.